and we've we've uh, come through the plagues in uh, this discussion of the events leading to the Exodus. So God has hammered Egypt, and now Pharaoh has folded. He's brought Moses and Aaron in and commanded them to leave. Now they can, uh, and this is consistent with the biblical presentation of authority. They can only go when Pharaoh, wicked, godless Pharaoh, says they can go. And that's an that's a interesting commentary on authority from a biblical perspective. Uh, and God uses authority, and all authority is of God. So that's a, that's a really important conversation to have. But at any rate, you see it clearly in this story. They can't go until Pharaoh says they can go. And now Pharaoh's, he's going to repent. He's going to recant and, and come after them. But in the moment, the crushing pressure of the plagues, the pressure of the people, and now the death of the firstborn, and they are, they are just uh, decimated. And so Pharaoh orders them out. The people are giving the Jews money to just get them out of here, gold and silver and precious jewels. And they, uh, they rise up and they are led out by this tower of cloud and fire and they're on their way to the Red Sea. And as we mentioned last time, or in the scripture reading, God didn't take them by the way of the Philistines because they were not ready for warfare. Although it would have been about an 11 day journey, uh, he takes them the long trip down to Sinai because he's gonna give them the law, a constitution for their new country, their new nation. And um, the constitution is going to be the word of God. And it'll, it'll be their directive about morals and ethics and values and social customs and theological positions and, and the redemptive process of God that he's gonna build into their, the very center of their encampment. And that's gonna be a study that we'll take a good long look at here in just a little bit. But uh, he gives all of them that, he gives them all of that by the, by the word of God at Sinai. And they're gonna be at Sinai for two years, learning how to be the people of God. They're gonna be at Sinai, learning how to build the tabernacle and all the, uh, all the gold and the silver and the, the planed wood for the floorboards. And I mean, they have to build the thing out of, uh, from scratch and God gives them uh, uh, giftings in metallurgy and in uh, goldsmithing and silversmithing. And, it's amazing because those are the kinds of things, these guys have been bricklayers in, uh, in Egypt for 400 years, but the, the artistry of gold and silver and all that's involved in that is something that's passed on for generations and really uh, can be lost to us uh, in, a, in a generational way. It's just got so, it's got so much craft involved in it that that the nuance of it is picked up through the process of time and passed on to generations. Well, God just breathes it into these people. It's an amazing thing what God can do in you by his spirit. And he can, uh, he can breathe into you giftedness and wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And uh, well, all the things that are listed as the gifts of the spirit in the, in the New Testament. So we left off chapter 13 and God leads them, goes before them in a pillar of cloud and fire, and he doesn't take it away. He's not going to take it away for 40 years until they enter in to the land of promise. So, chapter 14. Now, if you have questions or comments or criticism or debate or discussion or brilliant observations, you can make them on the chat part of the, uh, the live stream. And also, if you have my number, you can send it to me by text. I'd be happy to stop for a minute and, um, and try to, uh, as best I am able, to answer your question. All right, chapter 14, verse one. And the, um, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihiharoth and over between Migdal and the sea over against Baal Zephon before it shall, before it, you shall encamp by the sea. So these are rocky up thrusts. They are in literally between a rock and a hard place and between the, um, the proverbial devil and the deep blue sea. 
that's exactly where they are. And there's no turning around and there's no turning back. And there's only one way to go. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And God's laying a trap for, uh, for Pharaoh. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. He's, that's been uh, one of the overarching themes here. Pharaoh already is godless and says in the beginning, in the very first encounter, who is the Lord that I should obey him? I know not the Lord. And he's very boastful and proud and a God himself. And his father is a God. And, uh, and that's, that's the, uh, the theological construct of, of Egypt. And so God takes a man whose heart is already hard and utilizes that so that he can pour out more plagues when a sane individual would have stopped at plague number four or, or earlier and would have said, get out, go, go do what you got to do, but I let make this stop. But he hangs on for all of these plagues and finally relents at the death of the firstborn. And so God hardens his heart. Uh, an interesting read. Well, let's, let's take a look at it because I had some questions yesterday about, uh, about, did God obviate Pharaoh's free will? Well, no. God simply used a heart that was already hard and uh, allowed Pharaoh to go in a direction that he was uh, already heading in. And God utilizes his hardness and, and creates this advertising campaign that is very effective in Canaan. And even 40 years later, the, prof, uh, the, uh, the prostitute Rahab says, I know who you are to the two spies that Joshua sends in to case out the land. The, the harlot Rahab says, I know who you are. You're the people of the God that destroyed Pharaoh and destroyed Egypt. Your God is the God of heaven and earth. So the... The, uh, the events of the Exodus, the plagues and all that and the Red Sea. She said, your God opened up the waters of the Red Sea. So she was a believer. She was a convert by the word of God that got by rumor or innuendo or report all the way to Canaan's land. She said, our hearts melted. There was no spirit left in us when we heard what your God had done. And so... God uses, God uses um, uh, Pharaoh's hardness and obstinance uh, to further the damage and the legendary quality of the plagues that he pours out. But let's look at something here uh, about that uh, because God does not obviate free will. He allows you now, God will work with you in regard to that. But um, here's, uh, and, we, and we did some work in Romans chapter nine in regard to that earlier. But here's another interesting thing. Um, for therein, I'm in verse, I'm in chapter one of Romans, verse 17. Romans one and 17. I guess I were to read 16 because it's just so good. But 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So everybody has access to God. Everybody on the face of the earth has access to God. God called Abraham out of Ur, a pagan land of Chaldeans, but Abraham had access to God because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them. How? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. The natural creation speaks of God. The creation speaks of the creator, even his eternal power and Godhead. You can know God through nature 
and through the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God just simply says, I've painted it across the heavens. I've built it in. The resurrection is preached every morning when the sun rises, every springtime when the heat uh, and the new life and the and the eruption of life happens in the springtime and the deadness of winter is overthrown, God is preaching resurrection. And, and, and so uh, in the biblical phrase, does not nature itself teach you? And so this is, a, this is an overarching theme. God communicates very specifically by his word, but his word is the undergirding spiritual um, foundation of everything that is because everything came forth by the word and the word came forth by the spirit of God. So everything around you is infused with spirit and infused with word and everything around us preaches to us because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. We all came off the same boat with Noah We all came from the same Tower of Babel. We scattered and disseminated into all of the world. But uh, by the time, say, Abraham and Sarah go to Gerar, there's still a pocket of people there under Abimelech the king that are still innocent and have integrity and are righteous. They still worship and know God. And the stories of the flood are all over the world. The the vestigial uh, ideas and structures uh, that were incorporated into Noah's family and the extended family of Noah down at the Tower of Babel, those, those ideas disseminated into all the world. And so they are in verse 20 without excuse and Verse 21, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but but became vain in their thoughts. And they, as they scattered away, they decided, they chose to focus on other things and not on God, professing themselves to be, their, their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like into corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. This is an overview of the, I would say the progress of humanity, but the decline, the spiritual decline of humanity from Noah all the way to present time, biblical time. Wherefore God gave them up. They got all off into idolatry and worshiping other things, lost their minds. God gave them up to uncleanness. God let them go into uncleanness uh, through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. They had the truth of God. They knew the truth of God. And then generationally, they changed the truth of God in a, into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. They, mankind worships mankind. And, well, oh yeah, yay! Football stars, basketball stars, political stars, Hollywood icons. What are those? Those are points of worship. And what do they do? They gather in cathedrals, they gather in great stadiums, and they clap and they wave their hands and they lift their voice. And if you go and inspect the tutorials about worship and praise in the book of Psalms and otherwise, you'll find that what they're doing in every one of those venues is worship. And they're worshiping the creature more than the creator. And they'll go to church because they don't want to go to hell, maybe. But they, uh, they, uh, they really love their sports. And they love their country western band. And they love their rock and roll band. And they, they love their, they love their uh, Hollywood icons. And, oh, it's so-and-so. And, and, um, 
you understand? You see how that works? They worship the creature more than the creator who's blessed forever. And for this cause, because they decided to walk out on God, God gave them up. God gives them up. God yields them. <clears throat> and we're talking about free moral agency and free will. And specifically in Pharaoh, did God obviate his free will? No, God gave him up. God, he was inclined toward that. He was moving toward that. God let him go. And God just tweaked his heart a little bit and made it uh, more acute and more, um, more um, uh, hardened than it already was. God gave them up to vile affections for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. And so there's, there's all of the homosexual behavior in our world today is indicative of the fact of men's departure from God. And it is at a very, at a very elemental level, self-love, self-worship, worship, loving something like yourself. Uh, into that use which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lusts one toward another. And this has been in every culture. It's in Greece and Rome and Babylon and it's everywhere. Uh, men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves the recompense of their era, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient and then then he gives them and then there's this long list of things that are uh, downstream from that or uh, are the are symptomatic of having left God um, being filled even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient mm -hmm. so reprobate is like seared it's like you're gone and you can't get back it's like you're gone and you're, oh, this is so wonderful and I feel liberated and I'm not under the conviction. I don't feel any conviction or condemnation about anything that I'm doing. If you look in the word of God and you see a principle and you're working against that principle, but you don't feel any conviction or condemnation or uh, any concern about that at all, uh, you're taking your pulse and you are on the road to reprobation right then. It's a good time to camp out at an altar and try to get God to do, some, uh, to do some work in your mind and in your heart because you're moving toward reprobation, which is, uh, which is apparently irreversible. But um, <laughs> I, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, well, I don't, I'm doing this, but, and I love God, but I don't feel any conviction. And I don't feel any, uh, I don't feel any compunction about this at all. It's like, okay, it's not about your feelings. It's about the word of God. And if you're looking dead straight in the word of God and you're doing something in opposition to the word and you don't feel anything about that, hello and welcome to the road to reprobation. You're on your way right now. Okay. Um, question from Amy and Sean, when Paul said uh, being past feeling, did he mean reprobation or close to it? I think it's the same. I think it's the same journey uh, because we have conscious conscience, and we and we have something vestigial in us like God. It's our Jacob nature that cries out, "I want the birthright. I want, I want the blessing," and our Esau nature doesn't want it. Our Esau nature just wants to go to the concert and watch the movie and eat the food and, and go hunting and live his life and life is good. And, and you know, hey, there's so many wonderful things that you can enjoy in your world, but get it right with God first, like the days of Noah. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that the flood came and took them all away. Well, get it right with God and then eat and drink and marry and give in marriage. All of those things are okay and biblical and biophysiological, you know, uh, but get it right with God first. Okay, <clears throat> all right. So I will harden Pharaoh's heart, I'm in four of 14, and he shall follow after them and I will, 
And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? What have we, that we have let Israel go from serving us? Well, <clears throat> it's a good question because <clears throat> Their whole economy now was built on this vast nation of slaves that they had. And, and economically and practically, they're looking at it, and it, Egypt is decimated and has to be rebuilt. And the Egyptians don't want to do that kind of work, and so they, they need these. And, and in a moment of time, like under the pressure of the plagues and in the horror of the death of his firstborn, in that moment, he, the, the fog lifts, the spirit that is on these people lifts off of them and they see clearly. That happens in church all the time. People come to church or people look in the word of God and they see what is true and what is real. But then they step out back into their world, back on the job site, back in their home, back in their circle of friends. And they're like, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I you know, uh, and the, the spirit comes back down on them. It's like Jesus' story about the man who's delivered of a demon and the demon goes out into dry places and at some point decides, I'll go back to my house. And he comes back to his house and finds it swept and garnished. Like when you come to God, God starts cleaning you up and man, living for God makes you look better and living for God makes you cleaner and more organized and, and better because the biblical uh, construct covers every area of your life and you just get better in every area when you come to live for God or you should if you come in the biblical way, right? And uh, so the demon comes back and says, man, I love what you've done with the place. And he brings seven of his fellows and the guy's latter state is worse than his first. And so, so you have to... Uh, you have to understand that in an encounter with God, sometimes the demonic oppression or the demonic uh, confusion is lifted off of your life. But if you don't build on that and continue in that and, and find yourself a prayer life and a worship life and actively, proactively engage the things of God, those spirits will come back. And when they do, your vision changes back. Pharaoh says, why did we do that? Why did we let them go? Well, because look around, they destroyed you and your, your kids laying over in the corner dead. Well, that's why you let them go. But when that spirit comes back on you, it's the craziest thing in the world. It's like the guys at the door of Lot's house in Sodom on the night that the angels came to deliver, deliver Lot and the angel reaches out, boom, blasts them and makes them blind and they weary themselves to find the door. That's what sin will do. And that's what that, that, uh, that numbing spirit uh, will do. Uh, that blinding thing that happens to you when the, when the spirit of the world or the, uh, a certain type of spirit gets on you, you can't see. And uh, you don't think beyond the next moment. And, and, and so that's what happens to Pharaoh here. He had some repentance there for a minute and, and then lost it because the spirit of the day came back down on him. All right. Why did we let him go? Verse six, and he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Um, don't know exactly what that means other than they went out with strength or went out in celebration or uh, at any rate. Uh, but the Egyptians pursued after them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pihai Haroth and Baal Zephon. I wish you were here to read this. And see, when you're here physically in Bible study, I have you read and uh, let you read all the difficult passages. 
And <laughs> so we, we kind of have fun with that. But sadly, you're not here. And, but this is what happens when you leave Egypt, when you break out of the bondage, when you hear the word of God, the word, the promise of liberty, and you say, I'm going to do that. I need to do that. Or you come under conviction or the spirit of God moves on you and you say, I need to be a better person. I need to find God. I need to have answers for ultimate questions. I need to know where I'm going when I die. I have heard of heaven. I want to go to heaven. I have heard of hell. I don't want to go to hell just any number of ways of looking at this. But when you break out of Egypt and you're making your way into the plan of God, the promise of God, Egypt is going to pursue you. It's alive. It's real. It, it's consciousness. It's demonic. It's satanic. And you belong to him and he wants you back. And if you think that you're just going to come and pray a prayer, I mean, even if you cross over tonight and you come to church and get the Holy Ghost, get baptized in Jesus' name. You have the entry-level experience, but you don't have the framing to survive. And you will not survive unless you get the biblical framing. And so you have to, you have to diligently become a disciple. That's why Jesus built disciples. He walked with those guys for three years. And I mean, he wasn't with them two hours a week. He was with them 24 hours a day and taught them and drilled them and uh, emulated and modeled for them. And, uh, and so they had like this beyond doctoral level uh, training in the things of God. And, uh, and so you have, to, you have to build yourself. It's not like, I, okay, I got that done put the card in your pocket and it's all okay. You've got to come out and build yourself and come under the framing of the constitution of the word of God. And even then you're going to wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits, against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places and in the rulers of the darkness of this world. And you're going to wrestle against the vestigial Egyptian framing in your mind. You have to, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, chapter 12 of Romans, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice every day. You need to get up on that altar every day. You need to uh, take your cross and, and make it real. And he said, and be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to let God into you holistically. He, he's going to get into your mind. You have to learn new things, create a new knowledge base. He wants to get into your spirit. You have to have a prayer life and a worship life. And then he wants to get into your body. You've got to quit doing all the things you were doing that were Egyptian. And you have to start living in such a way that is pleasing to God. And so it's body, soul, it's mind and spirit. And you come to God holistically that it takes a while to learn all that. Now here Pharaoh is, he's pursuing Israel. Well, he's pursuing you too. And he's gonna catch you and overcome you, but you have, to, uh, you have to build yourself and grow yourself. First thing you have to do is pass through the water. You, have to, you need to get baptized. Um, and, the, and the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses, all the men, and verse 10, and when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and they were sore afraid and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So it's like, all right, I came to church. All right, I'm ready to live for God. All right, it's gonna be beautiful. And then some of the ugly things from the past rear up their heads or the old habits start kicking up sand and wanting to go back to Egypt and, and you start having a struggle and, uh, and it, it's on, it's going to be a war. It's going to be a fight. And the, the Jews were sore afraid. And they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Uh, wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? And so their, their exuberance, their high hand business didn't last, but for a few moments. And when they saw there was going to be a struggle, they uh, began to say, we could have just died in Egypt. We're going to die out here. Were there no graves in Egypt? 
Why? And then they begin to ask, why have you done this? Well, you know, you really have to buy into this thing. And they have, they have a slave mentality. And this is going to haunt them for the next 40 years. They're going to be singing this same song. Why did you bring us in this wilderness? Why did you bring us from... And they begin to venerate and lionize their experience in Egypt. You were slaves. You were getting beaten. You were working to build Pharaoh's treasure houses and all of that business. You had no dignity. You had no respect. You had no uh, place of fulfillment of potential. You couldn't worship. You were, you were not in the land of Abraham's promise. There were so many things wrong with that. And you really, when you come to this and you come to live for God, you really need to have that patriotic idea that we see in the, uh, in the early stages of the American Revolution. You need to be able to say, give me liberty or give me death. You really have to cross over. Life is not worth living unless I can live it on God's terms. And it just, you just really need to have an attitude about that because Pharaoh's coming after you and Egypt is down inside of you. And you're gonna fold up like a house of cards if you don't have an attitude. So you really have to have attitude. Develop an attitude where I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna make my way out of Egypt I'm going to live for God and, and uh, begin to buy into what God has said. But you have to exercise will and you have to have attitude about this. Is not this the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone. I told you, don't bring you out. I'm telling you, this is a bad sign. This is a bad sign. Uh, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Uh, it'd been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Well, listen, I'm going to die trying. I'm going to die on the way out, but I'm not going to live another day in Egypt. That has to happen in your mind. I'm going to, I, I may, I may die of the shakes, but I'm not going to live in that bottle anymore. I might die of withdrawal, but I'm not going to live by that needle anymore. I don't know how it's all going to work out, but I'm not going to live with the chaos in my home anymore. I'm coming out of Egypt. All right, and, and there's a million different ways that you can, you can look at that, but you, you have to get on board and you have to exercise will and embrace purpose. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, stand still, see the salvation of your Lord that he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. And so he's calming them and he's encouraging them and he's promoting the, uh, the idea of God in their life. And they are like a wife who's decided to live for God, but the husband's coming after her and he's kicking up dust and he wants, to, he wants his wife back to go clubbing and dancing and drugging and drinking and carrying on and all of that. And she wants to look like biblical ladies look and he wants her to look like a harlot and she's getting pressure from him and it's like oh i don't know if i can live for god well you won't live for god so you've got to really get a hard attitude about this and say look jack i'm going to live for god and i'm not going to live like that anymore and if you want deliverance come on come on in because living for god is going to be great but don't you begin to sing oh i can't live without my man <laughs> i can't live without whatever his name is uh, you really have to throw him on the altar. I mean, literally throw him on the altar and say, I'm gonna live for God. You do what you wanna do. And that has to happen because it starts with you. And you are only as effective in that, those primary relationships with husband or wife or children or vocation. You're only as effective in those relationships as you are sold out to the kingdom of God and you've got to cross over or you'll start singing these songs and you won't ever, you might go to church, but you won't ever be what God has called you to be unless you totally buy into this and you're ready to get out of Egypt. So 
Moses said, don't be afraid, stand still. You'll see the salvation of the Lord. The Egyptians that you've seen today, you won't see them again uh, forever. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. So that's what you need to know. You step out, you begin to live for God, God will show up. God will begin to fight for you. God will begin to make a way for you. So you have to, and that's what faith is, your confidence in the word of God. And the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. So we, we kind of see there that Moses to the people is like, quit being afraid, stand up, God's gonna show up. You won't see, these Egyptians are about to be destroyed here. But when God says, why cries thou unto me? You know, Moses, when he turned away from the people being all confident and bold and, and definitive and everything, he turned to God and he started crying to God. <laughs> oh God, what will we do? Look at this army that's coming up. And so God says, why are you crying to me? Speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. Well, there's Pharaoh behind, rocky walls on either side, and it's the ocean, it's the sea out in front of them. And he says, tell them to go forward. Well, this is really important because the kingdom of God goes forward. It always goes forward. It never stays static and it never goes back, all right? So the kingdom of God always go, goes forward. So you always go forward. Faith to faith, path grows brighter. Uh, it, it, it's a growth upward experience and trajectory. And that has to be the case with you. You can't stay where you are and you can't build memorials to the past and live there, whether good or bad. You have to keep growing. And ultimately we're looking for, we're leaving the whole world. We're getting a new body, we're going to heaven. And then who knows what that's gonna be like. And so it's, that's the mentality that we buy into. Tell them to go forward. There's an obstacle there, go forward. There's trouble there, go forward. God's gonna meet you there and God's gonna be involved with it. But lift up thy rod and stretch out, stretch out thy hand and over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go uh, on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I behold, I will harden the heart of the Egyptians and they will follow you, follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, on his chariots, and on his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. Again, this is going to be uh, the legend, the story in Egypt and among the people of God. And in the Psalms, they're gonna be singing Moses and Miriam's song. And, and, uh, and in Canaan, they're gonna be talking about it. And here we are in 2020, we're talking about it. Our Sunday school folks talk about it. Uh, our choirs sing about it. This, this is prototypical deliverance and, uh, and worthy of celebration. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and... Okay, we got bumped, and uh, this is going to be an interruption. Probably will be packaged uh, differently or maybe cut off the tail end of this... Uh, this video, but uh, for those of you that are still here, we wanted to uh, at least cap this off and finish this uh, 14th chapter. So um, the pillar of cloud went and stood between Israel and Egypt, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was cloud and darkness to them, to uh, Egypt, and um, and, but it was light by night to these, or so it was darkness to Israel, to Egypt, and it was light to Israel, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And uh, it is just like that. It is just exactly like that. From the outside looking in at the church, the world says, oh my goodness, I couldn't live like that. I don't want to live like that. What do you guys do? What's, what do you do for fun? What? 
<laughs> what is it like in there? And it looks like darkness. They can't see into it. The tabernacle was uh, covered with badger skins and it looked kind of uh, very unattractive, uh, kind of homely, uh, kind of rough on the outside. But in the inside of that, you, you had in the sanctuary, you had the candlelight, everything was gold in that uh, sanctuary and uh, all these linens and beautiful drapings and all of that. And then when you got into the Holy of Holies, it was illuminated by the glory of God itself. But on the outside, the world looking at it could not see it, couldn't see the light. But when the high priest went in, representing the people of God, when he goes in, he's illuminated. He's bathed in the light of the glory of God. And the presence of God is there. And in the, in the uh, Ark of the Testament, the provision of God is there. And the authority of God in Aaron's rod and the word of God, the structure for, for life and life more abundantly. All of that is there. And... Uh, and, and, and it's, it's just this wonderful, wonderful experience. It is full of light and life and light are synonymous biblically. Uh, John chapter one, in him was life and the life was the light of men and light is life and vice versa. And, and so it's from the outside, they can't see uh, what Israel sees. The Egyptians are in darkness. And looking at the tabernacle, you can't see inside. It just looks kind of rustic and uninviting and unimportant. But on the inside, glory and beauty and provision and redemption and the presence of God and all of that. And that's how it is in the church. They look at the church from the outside. And I know that. I was, uh, I was raised in a church experience. And man, for me as a kid, as a little kid, it was kind of interesting vacation Bible school and RAs and playing ball and all of the social parts of it. It was all pretty, pretty fun. But boy, the services were such a drag and, and training union was such a drag. And uh, the alternate Wednesday nights when we had to do Bible study, it was such a drag. It was totally uninviting and unfulfilling. And the last, I wanted to be somewhere else every time I was there. And I was, when I was 15, I quit going altogether because it became very apparent to me. It was in the 60s and it was uh, in South Louisiana and it was segregated. And all of that came to me uh, kind of in a moment of time when I understood that my whole community was absolutely racist. The schools were segregated, the churches were segregated, and it wasn't just that, but there was a lot of attitude and culture that went along with that. And I separated myself from, um, from that church for a lot of reasons. And I didn't go on, I didn't go on to be a paragon of virtue because I live like normal kids lived. I did, I drank and uh, smoked dope and, and all of those normal activities and everything. But if you mentioned anything to me about church, it was like, go away. I don't wanna, cause I couldn't see anything but darkness. I couldn't see any light in the church. <clears throat> and it wouldn't be for another like five years when we were 20 and we came into uh, some material by Josh McDowell on prophecy that we saw that the word of God was true and it lifted off of me. And now I saw at least the word of God as a source of light. And then we began to search for where can we find a church that actually teaches this, that believes this, that lives this. And we started a journey uh, we were 20, we were just kids, we were students at LSU, but we, we began a study of churches. I, I interviewed preachers, my whole social group was involved in this, these Bible studies and this prophecy study. And then it was like, well, what do we do with this? Is anybody doing this? So we started searching 
And my wife was raised in a certain kind of church and I was raised in a certain kind of church. And we went, I went back and interviewed the pastor and we called priests and we talked to all kinds of folks. But, but I, couldn't, I couldn't find it uh, until I, I came across some apostolic people and it was like, well, they are weird. They are very strange culturally, but boy, they believe the book and their answers are out of the book and they've got chapter and verse for everything. And then we came into it and then we uh, found the gospel and then we were baptized in the name of Jesus and then we were filled with the Holy Ghost in a summertime, sleepy summertime revival filled with the Holy Ghost and the whole world changed. The whole world changed. And now inside, I saw the light. Sounds like a song. I saw the beauty, the provision, the presence, the prophecy. From outside, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. You gotta come and see. David said, taste and see that the Lord, he is good. So it was darkness to the Egyptians. It was light to the Jews. And it's still like that today. In the world, they look at the church and go, my goodness gracious, how can you do that? Even peripheral Christians, denominal Christians that are more of a social gathering than a spiritual experience, they see real biblical experience as a dark kind of restrictive thing. They, they don't like it. But inside, it's good, liberating light, uh, the presence of God. Verse 21, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left and God is still our deliverer and God still makes a way where there is no way. And God still is a wall of water on our right hand and on our left hand. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked upon unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud. God was in that thing. God was in that cloud. And, uh, and the Lord troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels. That is one of the funniest things in all the word of God. God does some really interesting things, but some really funny things. These guys are, they're a great army. They're the most powerful army in the world. They've got the cool chariots and the slick horses and and all the wonderful things. They've conquered nations with these things. They're chasing this band of ragtag Jews, these slaves through this wall of water and they are intrepid, they're brave. They, they're going into the sea too. They've got a wall of water on one side and on the other. And, uh, and they're just blowing into their, their chargers, their horses, the manes are flying and, the, and uh, they look all stately and regal and Pharaoh's out in front of them and it's, it's worthy of a Hollywood production, better than that. And they go and God takes the wheels off their chariots. <laughs> God, God takes the wheels off. And I don't know if it's an angel with a lug wrench. I, I don't know how God does that. I don't know how God shows up, but he's, it's just so funny. God takes, and so then they're bottomed out and now their fine chariot is not a chariot in, in, at, at all. It's a sled. It's a sled and it's not on snow. <laughs> And, uh, and he's dragging them on sand and that sand is eating through the bottom of that chariot and they are moving slow and they were this rapid cavalry moving so fast and now he troubles them, takes the wheels off their chariots so that they drave them heavily. What a phrase. So that, and the Egyptians said, ah, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptian. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea 
that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned, covered the chariots, the horsemen, the host of Pharaoh and came into the sea after them there remained not so much as one of them. And when you leave Egypt and you come to the waters of baptism and Egypt is pursuing you and the sin and the mistakes and the bad decisions and everything you've done is pursuing you, the waters close over them all. And everything you've ever been or ever done that wasn't like God gets covered up by the waters of baptism. Isn't it, isn't it beautiful? But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Your old life now is dead. Paul's teaching, we are dead uh, our, our bodies, our, our life before, it's all buried in baptism. We are buried with him in baptism. And our old life dies and our new life begins. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And then chapter 15, Miriam and Moses start to sing and that's what you will do when you come to God and you uh, begin to uh, experience the power of God and salvation you'll get a new song in your heart and you'll begin to sing uh, and worship and praise and magnify God well uh, we're going to stop here we'll pick up uh, next time we're going to do an overview of their travel and we're going to uh, start looking at the law and the centerpiece of the law, which is the tabernacle plan. And so we're gonna start a study of the tabernacle plan next time. That will be um, Saturday at um, 1230. And um, I'll have a prophecy study at 130. We have a couple of studies tonight, but they're not in sequence. And uh, then Monday we'll be back at it again, Lord willing. So. Let's have some prayer. God, we thank you for the privilege of studying your word today. We thank you for the great privilege of life in your kingdom. We pray your hand of blessing and strength on all of your people. Prosper them and bless them in all that they do. Cause them, God, to walk up and down in your promise, walk up and down in your blessing to actualize every good thing you have for them. And we pray that you would do it in the name above every name, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.